pleased to be here with all of you this afternoon. Uh, first of all, I want to express my appreciation of uh, your hard work. I heard uh, Principal Devananda is, is the leader initiate, initiated his place and he invited uh, me to come and lead the discussion. So I want to express also my sincere thanks to Bob, who is Bob, <laughs> who also has, no, has done enormous amount of work to make this place look like this now. I heard this was not like this before. It was just a barn or some farmhouse. Now it looks like a beautiful triangle. And this is a symbol of peace. Buddhist temple, Buddhist shrine, Buddhist uh, monastery is nothing but a symbol of peace. So we are very grateful for Venerable Devananda and his teacher Venerable Anuddha in Sri Lanka and other old Venerable monks giving their full support to Bab and you all, this community, to make this place such a valuable, meaningful, peaceful place for all of you to gather and uh, meditate and discuss the Dharma, discuss the message of peace. Building a temple, Buddha said, uh, Sampam dato te sohoti yodhe upasava. Amatam dato te sohoti yodhamma manusasati. I say this thing in Pali for my own enjoyment. <laughs> because I know you don't understand Pali. <laughs> and yet, when I say these words in Pali, the Buddha's language, I enjoy it tremendously because every word in his language in his teaching is meaningful. What the, the meaning of this stanza is uh, <coughs> one who donates or builds a temple, Buddhist monastery, gives everything. Amata says teaching Dhamma is giving in Russia deathlessness. Amata means deathlessness. What else can you get from a Buddhist temple? Peace. When you come to a temple, you don't come for political discussions. You don't come to discuss economy, social conditions, to discuss various other things but you come to a temple, particularly to Buddhist temple, to talk about something very deep and meaningful for our life. What is meaningful? To live peaceful, harmonious, friendly life through the teaching of the Buddha. Buddha's teaching from the very beginning to the end is a message of peace. He never promotes violence in thoughts, words, or deeds. If somebody practices his instruction and simply as his Lord, that person lives peacefully in this life and that person promotes peace, what else do we expect in life? Peace and happiness. Friends, we do so many things in our life to make us happy. To sometimes marry, to make you happy, or to sometimes to divorce. Because you are not happy. <coughs> right? And stay without marrying any partner for a long time. Then you feel lonely and marry again. I met a man who said he married seven times. First time he married and uh, he was so 
in patience, his wife was so upset, she divorced him. Second time he married, and she was impatient, upset, and he divorced her. Third time he married, then he was always arrogant, angry, and upset with his wife. So he divorced her. Fourth time he married, she was upset, arrogant, and divorced him. Fifth time he married, and she, he, she found him to be ungrateful, unfaithful. So she divorced him. Then he married six times. He said, this time my wife was unfaithful, and I divorced her. Bhante, I am going to marry this time a perfect woman. I never saw him again. <laughs> So, friends, so many things we do to make us peaceful and happy. All these are not going to be bringing us peace and happiness. We have to do something far more important. Whenever we do something wrong, we cannot get right results. In the hope of getting peace and happiness, we do something which will not promise peace and happiness. We all have to do something to bring us peace and happiness. That something comes from our own, from the development of our own mental states. Our own mental state. Why? All our troubles coming not from outside, Nobody can bring, give us peace and happiness. Only the state of mind that we cultivate in a direct, right, direct, right way, that brings happiness. So a temple is a place where monks, devotees, supporters, people who visit, devote their time to develop their mind, cultivate their mind to live a peaceful life. And therefore, we all must be very grateful to Bab, Venerable Devananda, his teachers, all other supporters of this place, who established a place for people around here to come, meet, discuss, learn, a way to develop their mental state to become peace. When you come here, aren't you peaceful? You can be very friendly with each other. You come to meditate, you learn Dhamma, and you go peacefully. Therefore, I was invited to lead the discussion, not to give a talk. So, friends, <coughs> I like to lead the discussion, provided you have questions. I'd be very happy to spend time with you all answering the question, Dhamma questions. I'm pretty sure all these five since we have been coming here have learned some Dhamma and have come up with some questions you <coughs> might have discussed them what satisfactory answers to all your questions, and still there may be some. I don't promise that I can answer all your questions, but I will be happy to spend some time <coughs> with answering questions. So friends, in this opening note, I like once again to thank all those who have very sincerely, honestly support this place and going to support this place for bringing peace to you as well as the neighbors of this uh, temple. With this note, I conclude my note and I invite you to ask me questions. <coughs> to open the discussion. Mm -hmm. If you write yeah, the question, it will be even better, yes? Very good. 
And when you write, please make sure that you write legibly. <laughs> Because I sometimes I cannot decipher you know, <laughs> and I hospitals, schools, and uh, around the United States, do you think <coughs> uh, what is this word? Can I see? <coughs> do you think practicing mindfulness without the support of Sila can make people become addicted to meditation without solving problems in life? So one question. Second one, can this practice increase <coughs> the ego or the self? This practice? Can this practice increase <coughs> the feelings of ego or self, uh, like the, the perception? Because it doesn't have the sila, sila, samadhi, and panya. OK. I think this is a very good question. Mindfulness has to be practiced with uh, seeing. See that is uh, observing moral, ethical principles. Now, <clears throat> yes, it is true. There are a lot of people who try to practice mindfulness and uh, not very much successful because uh, their base foundation is not firmly established. Foundation of mindfulness in the very highest sense of the practice, of sense, mindfulness is something that we practice with the foundation of the seal or morality. However, if somebody were to wait until morality is perfect to practice meditation, that person never meditates. It is just like a man going to a seashore and wait for the sea to become calm, for him to have a swim, this fellow never swim. Similarly, even without the, uh, very perfect sila, with imperfection, you have to start right away. As you keep practicing, then you learn from your own experience that the practice is not going to produce expected successful results. And therefore you look back, even then you begin to question why the practice is not successful, why I don't get su successful results. Because something is wrong, you correct it. And while correcting yourself, you keep Go, go on practicing. Then, both your morality as well as the mindfulness will grow together. You cannot wait until the morality is perfect. But it is very important to start the practice right away. And then, as the morality, as the practice of mindfulness develops, you become more aware, more mindful of the shortcomings and the why you are not successful and then you correct your shortcoming and then practice mindfulness. So these two go hand in hand. 
<coughs> you said, uh, does it lead to <coughs> developing ego, right? If you're too attached to your practice. Right, if you're attached to the practice. Right. Now, one thing when we practice mindfulness, uh, if you are really sincerely practice mindfulness and underst practice it with understanding, then slowly and gradually you chip off the ego of yourself. Because mindfulness shows, uh, to be very honest, you know, very strictly speaking, Buddhist mindfulness practice, uh, when you do mindfulness practice, <coughs> what we normally see? We see everything is always changing. Everything is impermanent. Everything is permanently impermanent. <laughs> Not impermanent today and tomorrow permanent. But everything, without any exception, all the time is changing. This is very honest, sincere way of seeing Practicing mindfulness. There are three, everything is marked with three characteristics. They are so deeply engraved in everything. You will never miss them if you really practice mindfulness. What are the three things? Everything is impermanent. Anicca. Changing, 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 changing. You hear, if you mindfully listen to words, you hear impermanence. If you mindfully see with eyes, you see impermanence. With, you, with mindfulness, if you smell, you smell impermanence. When you taste anything with your tongue mindfully, you experience impermanence. When you touch something, Mindfully, you experience impermanence. The feeling, feeling coming. So, that which is impermanent is not satisfactory. Right? That something impermanent is not satisfactory. Sometimes you may logically ask, well, if something not pleasant, if that changes, is it not Satisfactory? For instance, you have pain. Since pain is impermanent, when pain changes to pleasure, is it not satisfactory? You may argue, not satisfactory. Why? This pleasure is not permanent. Pleasure can change into pain. And therefore, no matter what it is, it is unsatisfactory. In impermanence itself is not unsatisfactory in a way. Then what is unsatisfactory? You know, sometimes people say, we say that everything is impermanent, and then, <coughs> suppose someone practice mindfulness and attain full enlightenment, impermanent things keeps going on in being impermanent forever. That is why I say impermanence is permanently impermanent. What one do, what does, when one attains high level of enlightenment, is learning not to become attached to the impermanent things. When something is impermanent and unsatisfactory, Something else also is there, which normally not people like to hear. But it is very clearly marked. I mean, nowhere, even in the time of, time of the Buddha, people did not like to hear this. But <coughs> Buddha, Buddha, Buddha's purpose was not to say something to please others. His purpose was not to say something that they like. He wanted to always tell the truth. 
truth, in the Buddha's eyes, truth is the sweetest of all the sweets. Satchang have sadhu karam rasana. Among all the tastes, the tastiest is the truth. That is not what we hear, right? Truth is bitter. But if our mind is pure, clean, impartial, unbiased, we really will enjoy the truth. So Buddha is the one who enjoys the truth. So he said, truth is the sweetest of all the sweets. That means, the third one I was going to say, out of these three characteristics, first is impermanent, second is unsatisfactoriness, third is also, is 100% true, although people don't like to hear or accept it. What is that? Selflessness. No self. We use the word selflessness for very uh, superficial meaning. In deep down in our subconscious level, there is something that we want to keep permanently unchanging, immutable, permanent, eternal something. Within this ever-changing entity that we live in, we can never find something uh, permanent, immutable, everlasting. Everything is constantly, continuously changed. In mindfulness practice, these are the three things invariably we see. There's no one single thing in our entire personality that we find to be permanent. So, when we see impermanence, unsatisfactoriness and selflessness, there is no reason for one to become proud, become attached, become egotistic. Why? There is no reason, there is no ego. And therefore, in real mindfulness training, one learns these three things. Not outside, but inside. In ourselves, we see these three things. And therefore, your question is a very important question. And uh, if somebody sincerely, honestly practice mindfulness, one develops morality and see these three characteristics in oneself. You may not see all of them very quickly, especially <coughs> the last one, because we always have been taught, trained to thinking that there is some ego. And uh, to let go of it, not to accept it all of a sudden, would be very, very difficult. Very difficult. <coughs> I, in the time of the Buddha, it was <coughs> just like now. I tell you, once I wrote a paper, and I got one of my American friends to edit my paper. I gave him, and he took the paper and disappeared for about six months. After six months, he came back. And then, uh, as soon as I saw him, I remembered my paper. So I didn't want to break the subject so quickly. Uh, I said, uh, let us go for a walk. So we went for a walk. Even during our walk, I did not want to bring this up to, I thought I might hurt his feelings. 
Fine was uh, beating around the bush, saying various things, and finally came to the subject. And I asked him, uh, you must have been very busy these days. He said, yes, I was busy. Uh, that may be the reason why you, have, you pro probably might have not had time to see my paper. Then he said, one day I read the paper. I read the paper, but when I came across one sentence that says that there is no self, no ego, I got so angry, I threw away the paper. I never saw the paper again. This man was very angry. How can we live without self? That is the core of our existence. And this fellow said that there is no soul, no self. What are we? Just mere bottomless abyss? How can we exist? This is very normal reaction, attitude people get when they hear this. So we don't blame them. This is the way we have been trained, conditioned. And therefore, in Vipassana meditation, mindfulness meditation, don't try to fool yourself. Don't try to wipe or something, push something, uh, put, sweep something under the rug and say, I don't want to deal with that, I will deal with everything else. But this thing, I postpone. No, friends, you cannot make the progress in mindfulness practice. In order to make the progress, you have to accept the whole package. <laughs> this comes in one package, not part of it. So, when we really honestly practice it, accepting the by the whole package, then there is no room for us to become egotistic or to become attached to the practice. And so, attachment to the practice also will fade away if he practices honestly and sincerely. I think that sometimes uh, when people teach the mindfulness, all they, all they do is just uh, teaching the breathing, breathing in and breathing out and being non-judgmental about when the thoughts wander. And people may not really quite understand that mindfulness is something that you cultivate so that you have to be aware, remember, you know, that what is this when something arises in your mind? You know, this is like greed, this is, you know, I don't believe that uh, when they teach the mindfulness in those settings, those are brought up. I think they're just being, talking you about right. what they bring now. You are right, uh, that is why she says, she says when uh, people practice mindfulness, all they do is sitting in one place, focusing mind on the breath, breathing in, <coughs> breathing out. That is not the entire practice. But the beginningfulness of breathing is the entire practice. Because <coughs> when we look at it superficially, it is very simple. Only there are sixteen pairs. You just you can memorize the sixteen pairs within an hour if you want. But that is not all. That is just the beginning. So, <coughs> mindfulness of reading is a very profound discourse. It was delivered to very highly enlightened monks. Among them, there were unenlightened monks as well, but very prominent members in the audience to listen to this sermon were very highly evolved, spiritually wrong, enlightened monks, like Venerable Sarguta, Venerable Moggalana, Venerable Mahakasapa, Venerable Anuruddha, Venerable 
Babu, when they were Kimbira, when they were Ananda and so forth, except when they were, when they were Ananda, all others had attained full enlightenment. The Buddha delivered this sermon to this full enlightenment monks. And this is the only discourse where he mentioned 44 subjects of meditation. So the mindfulness of breathing is just the, the, the core of mindfulness practice. One day when the Ananda asked the Buddha, after attaining enlightenment, when the Buddha said, are you still meditating? He said, yes. And if uh, uh, you don't mind, could you tell me the subject of your meditation? He said, I'm using the breath, mindfulness of breathing. Before he attained enlightenment, when he was a little child, when uh, his nurses brought uh, for the driving festival and put him under a four-second tree and left to join the festivities, he was all alone. And that moment, as a little child, he started practicing mindfulness of breathing. When he was struggling to attain enlightenment, after leaving his uh, teachers, when he was alone, he thought, what subject should I use for my practice? Then he found mindfulness of breathing. So the mindfulness of breathing, or focusing mind on the breath, is for it's the beginning as well as the end, because it has so many things in it to understand when you practice it very diligently. So teaching mindfulness of breathing is okay. Uh, focusing mind on the breath is very good, but we have to lead the meditator step by step further to develop full mindfulness practice. And therefore, <coughs> uh, full practice is there, but we have to bring the thing up. By the way, I have written a book on this, my latest book called Four Foundations of Mindfulness, where I have emphasized how to use the breath as a full subject of meditation. I'm not trying to promote my book, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, I advise, if you are interested and very serious about the practice, it is my my trademark is plain English. Mindfulness in plain English, uh, eight steps to happiness in plain English, uh, journey to mindfulness in plain English, beyond mindfulness in plain English, and this one also in plain English. I speak plain English, <laughs> and I write in plain English. And this one is particularly written for people who are not familiar with meditation. So, mindfulness of breathing is the main theme of this book. It came out last year, and uh, if you go to Amazon, you can see the book. And I uh, advise you to read it as uh, I give a, I have given several many illustrations and similes, examples and practical instructions. Yeah. Yes. As Bob says, Bhante Ji. Um, <laughs> Buddha's Buddha's teaching. 2,500 years ago, so true, and it is more relevant today. In in specific uh, question about Kali Yuga, Buddha has taught that between Buddhas, between Gautama and the future Buddha, Maitri is a time period for Kali Yuga. And if you look around the world today, what's going on, whether it's in Boston, whether it's in some other place, it is so true. So mindfulness is absolutely true and we are so lucky to live in this time period and we have a duty to perform. So mindfulness becomes very important. Can you elaborate on Kali Yuga? Or oh, English translation would be turmoil <coughs> period. My dear friend, I am not expert in Kali Yuga. 
this is um, a term not found in the Pali literature. Yeah. This is a term coined by people to explain or describe this period between that we have this culture. Definitely, <coughs> for the last 2600 or 2500 years, uh, so many things have changed. Uh, even while Buddha was alive, uh, Paharada, Vendabar, uh, Sariputta asked the Buddha, Vendabar, sir, in the past you had a very few rules and regulations, but more people attain enlightenment. Now we have more rules and regulations, <coughs> less people attain enlightenment. What is the reason? Buddha said, Paharada, Koshari Buddha, those days people who renounced household lives, entered monastic life, were very much like dry desert, where there is no water, no rain, everything is dry, the ground, the ground is the, 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 the earth is cracked here and there because of lack of water. When a rain comes, every drop will be absorbed. But they were waiting, waiting. Similarly, people who entered the order early days were so thirsty of Dhamma. They are so sincere, so honest. They would do anything to absorb the Dhamma, practice Dhamma very honestly, sincerely. Now, more and more people came in. They came in with various motivations. Not with that sincerity, that honesty. Their motives are different. And therefore, the community has been corrupt. Their practices they are so complacent. Practice is so weak. They don't have been in the time of the Buddha itself. Now, <coughs> 2,500 years later, it has diluted. Practice has become so weak. People, not only common people, even monastics, are not that uh, serious, that uh, seriously practicing, and therefore attainment has become very rare commodity, very rare. And that has been going on for so many centuries, and it will be like that until the permanent. Nobody can take it away and make some maybe permanent. But the practice slowly, slowly <coughs> disappears. So that is what is happening. The more people become materialistic and less spiritual. You can expect all kind of things, things that are happening now. And therefore, that is why I'm so glad, so happy to see a place like this for people to revise the practice, try to taste the truth of Dhamma in their own personal life. This Dhamma, Buddha said, this Dhamma is personally realizable personally realizable. This is not the Dhamma that we accept 
through belief. This is Dharma that we realize within ourselves. So we need time, place to practice to realize the Dharma that we have in us. So, I think this uh, perhaps may answer your question. So, any other question? Yes? Well, back to um, what you were talking about earlier with mindfulness of breathing and how even the Buddha, after enlightenment, practiced mindfulness of breathing. <coughs> Um, I'm interested in your thoughts on a certain approach to meditation, a certain way of thinking about it, that's pretty common, uh, that says samatha meditation, uh, that type of meditation that has a primary object, like the breath, is a preparation for vipassana, um, a type of meditation that technically has no primary object, where everything is, is the object. Um, and I'm wondering if you think that there's a place um, in the meditative journey where meditation that focuses on a primary object uh, becomes something to put aside in favor of um, just seeing the three characteristics in everything that arises. Now, there seems to be some uh, uh, confusion in the question itself. Uh, we must understand the difference between Samatha meditation and Vipassana meditation. What is Samatha meditation? What is Vipassana meditation? <coughs> Samatha meditation is, Samatha is Pali word, uh, Sanskrit Samatha. Uh, which means calming, tranquilizing, making the mind peaceful to gain concentration. That meditation, that system of meditation is called Samadha meditation. That is the meditation system that we use uh, to gain deep concentration, culminating in attaining what is called jhanas. One, two, three, four jhanas. And after that there are some immaterial jhanas. So to gain that state of concentration, we need one single object to focus the mind. So selecting one single object to focus the mind to gain concentration is some of the meditation technique. For vipassana meditation, any subject is acceptable. Anything, your body, your feeling, perceptions, thoughts, sound, sight, smell, taste, element, whatever, anything we can use to gain insight. That is practice, that is called mindfulness practice. Why? Anything we focus our mind on, is clearly marked with these three characteristics. And therefore, Vipassana meditation can use any subject. Samatha meditation use only one subject. One subject at a time according to the person's uh, way of gaining concentration, the ability to gain concentration. So, having said this distinction between these two, I must say, which one we have practiced first out of these two? Which of these we should practice first? Your question, you said, Samatha meditation is to be practiced to prepare for Vipassana. To some action there is a truth in it. Because some people are very good in gaining concentration for them. To some people, for some times, gaining concentration is easy. 
And therefore, at that time, for that person, using one subject and gain concentration is very good. Another time, another person cannot gain concentration that easily, that quickly. For that time, for that person, practice vipassana first. There are four ways in Pali it's called Samatha Purbhanga Vipassana, Vipassana Purbhanga Samatha, Yugananda, and internal tranquility. Adhyatan Sannisidana. These are the four methods. Samatha Purbhanga Vipassana means uh, practicing Vipassana uh, preceded by Samatha. That means you practice Samatha first, and then practice Vipassana. The other method is to practice Vipassana first and then practice Samatha. Third method is Yuganatha means combining these together, practicing parallel to each other. Fourth method is uh, you just inwardly settle your mind. Uh, that specifically is neither Samatha nor Vipassana, something combination of both. So, popularly, these three methods, Samatha Bhubhava Vipassana, that means Vipassana preceded by Samatha, the other one, Samatha preceded by Vipassana, the third is Yuganatha. Yuganatha means the combination of both at the attainment of stream entry which I have explained in my book called Beyond Mindfulness in Plain English. So, if somebody likes to practice tranquility meditation, concentration meditation, because the person has good power of concentration, that's very good for him. But he or she should not stop there. <coughs> then the person must go to personal meditation. Another person is intellectual, mind, the person cannot gain concentration because so many things are going on in the mind. So the person take look at each of them, pay attention to each of them and see the similar characteristic in each of them. That person is person. And then through that practice, what he sees or he or, he or she sees is that they all have a similar character, same thing everywhere, and therefore there's nothing special to excite the person. The mind becomes calm, relaxed, peaceful, they concentrate, they practice concentration meditation. <coughs> Once you gain concentration, you don't stop there. You have to use vipassana to deepen your understanding. Whenever these two combine together, you can uh, still deeper concentration to see things exactly as they are. As Buddha said, uh, Samahita Chitta Nyatha Bhutta Padanati, concentrated mind can see things exactly as they are. So whether you are practice tranquility meditation or mindfulness meditation, you are eventually gaining very deep, powerful, to see exactly things in a very minute way. Um, thank you first for writing that book, uh, The Serenity and the Path, uh, Path to Serenity. That was very uh, illuminating. Um, and I've tried to practice the mindfulness of breathing. And I have a couple questions for you. Um, I've noticed that w when my mind actually settles on the breath, and I no longer have to make an effort to stay with the breath. It seems as though it's continuous. My mind is continuous on the breath. And uh, if it's true that everything is arising and passing away, why is it that it appears that the mind is continuously on the breath? And I guess the second part of the question is, at what point, if you're practicing mindfulness of breathing, um, at what point do you begin to look for the three characteristics or 
any insight in, into the practice? I think a very good question. Very good question. In the happening in between. That means even every breath we breathe in, in every breath you can see impermanence, unsatisfactoriness and selflessness, every breath. Inhaling, you can see these three things. Exhaling, you can see these things. Because the breath comes in while changing itself. That leaves our lungs while changing itself. And as the mind gets sharper and sharper, we begin to see these minutest changes within the inhaling and exhaling. And there we see these three characters, every breath. You know, there is a very beautiful uh, uh, discourse in uh, what is called Anguttara Nikaya, where Buddha has mugs. Months, <coughs> this is very important to remember. Months, do you practice mindfulness of death? When you hear the death, it is something uh, for everybody perhaps, very unpalatable, unpleasant subject. But uh, when our understanding deepens, it is not unpleasant, unpalatable, negative subject. Why? Because we are going through that every nanosecond. <laughs> that is taking place every second. That is taking place. If you understand it uh, very thoroughly. So, when Buddha asked this Bhikkhus, do you practice mindfulness of death? There were six months. One month said, yes, yes, friend of myself, I practice mindfulness of death. Uh, then Buddha asked, how do you practice it? He said, if I live one day and one night, uh, that time is, is enough for me to develop the mindfulness of death. Then another month said, Whenever I say, if I live one day, not one day and night, one day, that is enough for me to practice mindfulness of death. Third one said, whenever I say, if I live long enough to go from uh, my putty, my living cottage, to a village to collect arms, food and return that journey, to go on the ground and return is enough for me to practice mindfulness of death. Fourth month said, whenever I said, if I have time to eat my aunt's food, <coughs> if I have lived long, if I live long enough, <coughs> that time would be enough for me to practice mindfulness of death. Fifth month said, whenever I said, if I have enough time to eat one morsel of food, that time is enough for me to practice mindfulness of death. The sixth monk said, Venerable Sir, 
if I live long enough to inhale and exhale, that is long enough for me to practice mindfulness, okay. Buddha said the bhikkhus, these two last months, one said, I, if I live long enough to complete one morsel of food, and the one who said, if I live long enough to have one inhaling and one exhaling, Buddha said, these are the two monks who really practice mindfulness of death, and these are the diligent, mindful monks. Why is that? Because mindfulness of death can be seen in one inhaling and one exhaling. Meaning, because inhaling breath comes by chaining. You can see that the, the whole meaning of death in one inhaling, whole meaning in one exhale, meaning of death in one exhale. And therefore, in one inhaling we can see impermanent, impermanence, unsatisfactoriness, and selflessness. We don't have to look for something else to see this. Uh, we feel sad, sorry, and compassionate. Out of compassion, uh, we might be, we think how to eliminate this, how to stop these things. Uh, so, the underlying principle even there is how to bring happiness. These things happen because uh, those who caused those things were not happy. So we feel that, gee, this is very uh, sad, very uh, un uh, unacceptable, but uh, this person certainly may be suffering from something. So, how to help not only the victims, but even the criminals who call it so many things. Uh, we always go after the victims to help the victims. But the one who caused the crime or some kind of atrocity, also has been suffering from some psychological issues. <coughs> so we want to be, we want to find a way to even help even that person. So it, in both ways, it helps <coughs> to some extent. Of course, sometimes we watch those things, uh, we become helpless and we just uh, amazed and sad, sometimes we get angry. So, uh, the real motive for watching those things should be uh, to bring happiness to everyone, as far as we can. For instance, we all see this recently, you know, in, uh, what do you call this, uh, Washington. <coughs> This marathon, right? And there was a bombing. So many people were killed, so many people were injured. So uh, our attention goes there. We get, we feel sad. Sometimes we get angry. And uh, why? Why we get sad? Why we angry? Because. Uh, this person uh, took away other people's happiness, their lives, their health, and so forth. On the other hand, we also must think, why these people do this? Because they themselves have some problems. We cannot solve all these problems. But inwardly we feel how nice if we have a way 
to help these people who caused this trouble. See, there is there was a way to prevent this from happening. So inwardly what we really have a compassion, an intention, willing to bring true peace to happiness. Sometimes people might go to all these things and they try to forget about it. That of course is not uh, something we uh, always want to promote. But if possible, we know that we cannot solve all the problems in the world. But in our smallest way, we try to train our children to live in peace and harmony without causing those things in future. What has happened is certainly we cannot do anything about it. So from those things we learn our ways to bring peace in future. Yes. Uh, I have a very simple question. Uh, according to Buddhist uh, philosophy, is it seem to say white lies? Um, like for example, if a, if a child or <coughs> asks a question from uh, their parents, um, it, like the parents has to say the truth or can they just say a white lie? Is it, is it a sin? I think... Uh... <laughs> Parents always must train themselves to tell the truth, not even white lie. Because uh, when they teach children, when they tell lies, even white lies to children, children, children are like a sponge, they absorb everything. Whatever comes from the parents is the authority. They think, I have heard children say, my mom said like this. When we say something, if it is contradicting to what he has heard <coughs> from the mother, he says, no, 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 my mother said like this. They always quote their parents as the authority. And therefore, they are the ones who very sincerely, honestly, practice, should practice the principle or precept of telling the truth. One time, this is a important thing, one time an eight-year-old girl came with her parents and grandparents to our place. We were sitting in the porch uh, here and there were benches for people to sit in West Virginia. In front of all these people, this girl said, eight years old, girl said, Vendor Bante, we children, we can observe the five precepts. We don't kill, we don't steal, we don't commit uh, sensual misconduct, we don't lie, we don't drink. But our parents cannot observe any of them. <laughs> <laughs> this little girl. Parents were blocked. <laughs> they looked at each other. Grandparents were blocked. They were so embarrassed. So, see the way the children observe. Don't underestimate children. They are always observing. And therefore, parents must learn to tell the truth to children. Not even then, why it like? Uh, so, the question is, if, if a, a small child asks where, where does the uh, babies come from, so how can we tell the truth? We no. kind of have to deviate from the truth. You can tell the truth. You can tell, suppose a two-year-old girl comes and asks you, Daddy, how was I born? You tell, darling, you are too young to understand this. I tell you, when you are a little older, suppose this girl 
he goes out and she plays, she will never remember that. On her wedding day, she comes and asks, Daddy, <laughs> father would call the girl, father would call the girl and ask, Darling, when you are two years old, you ask me a question, this question, do you want me to answer the question? She would say, no, Daddy. <laughs> She gets the answer as time passes, as she grows older, as she associates with other people, she gets the answer. So when the child is too young, in order, instead of telling a lie, Oh darling, I went to hospital and came back with you. You, around, you make the girl even more confused. Oh, he would say, I went to the shopping mall, <laughs> no. You just take time and uh, tell her, I tell you, when you are ready, you are still not ready, you are too young to understand. You can tell the truth, but she doesn't understand it because it is an adult subject. You. So this normally happens. So in order to maintain your household life, as well as uh, spend time in meditation, you have to set up time at home to meditate at least a couple of times a day, so that you can uh, continue the practice and periodically, maybe you weekends and so forth, you can go to uh, a place where you can spend more time in meditation. This way you can have some balance. But if you want to have the same uh, amount of time to meditate at home as you are in the meditation center, that would be difficult because home the atmosphere is quite uh, different. So I would uh, suggest uh, uh, you have to divide your time between uh, household activities and meditation practice. At home, anybody can meditate at home if they make a proper schedule to spend at least twice a day, morning and evening. <clears throat> and then when you get into the uh, team of meditation and what you are really doing in meditation, then you can incorporate that experience into your daily life. For instance, as I mentioned repeatedly from the beginning of this discussion, we try to see impermanence. We can do it in any time, whether in a meditative uh, uh, meditation center or at home, uh, while eating, drinking, working, talking, and so forth, in all times, we can at least uh, uh, notice how things are changing. Our feeling changes, our perception changes, our thought changes, uh, ideas, memories all change. And try to pay attention to these changes any time during the day or night, wherever you are. At that time you are meditating. Yes, one more question. <coughs> yeah. um, in the four foundations of mindfulness, the Gaya, Vedana, Gita, and Dharma, can a person Focuses on focus on just one, say like observe your mind, because that individual may not be good in focusing on uh, the Dharma, which is pretty difficult. If, if someone approach the four foundation of mindfulness in each one 
and not like entire 16 steps. <coughs> and that individual can see the three characteristics. Let's say I, I observe my, my mind and then see something arises and then gone. So it's the birth, the, the coming to being and then the death of it. And then start to dissolve the self uh, identity or the concept. Is that possible to do? It's possible. Is that it's possible. So her question is this. Uh, out of four foundations of mindfulness, four foundations are mindfulness of the body, mindfulness of feelings, mindfulness of the mind, and mindfulness of Dhamma. These are the four foundations. She asked me, can one practice one of them to have the knowledge and awareness of impermanence, unsatisfactoriness, and selflessness? I say yes, one can practice one. In uh, Anapana Satisutta, mindfulness of reading discourse, which has been divided into these four categories, it has, it has uh, 16 pairs. Four, each four pairs are named as tetrad. Each tetrad has four pairs. First four pairs are mindfulness of the body. Second four pairs mindfulness of the feelings. Third four pairs mindfulness of the mind. And the last four pairs mindfulness of the Dhamma. At the end of each pair, each what you call tetrad, Buddha said, you can practice seven factors of enlightenment. You practice only one, one tetra. At the end of that, you can practice seven factors of enlightenment. If you practice the second, at the end of that, you can practice seven factors of enlightenment. If you practice number three, at the end of that, you can practice seven factors of enlightenment. If you practice only the last one, at the end of that, you can practice seven factors of enlightenment. So, if you undertake any one of them, you can have a full, complete practice. Don't worry. When you practice one, you practice all. Yes. Yes. What are the seven factors of enlightenment? <laughs> See? <laughs> Can you, or more specifically, do you have to be a Buddhist monk in order to achieve enlightenment and be successful in mindfulness? Yes. Seven factors of enlightenment are mindfulness practice, number one. Second, investigation of Dhamma, number two. Third is perseverance, effort. That is factor of enlightenment. Fourth is joy. Fifth is happiness or tranquility. Tranquility. Concentration, your mind is balanced, in balance. Then you have equanimity type of enlightenment. So these seven factors of enlightenment develop in that order. It doesn't uh, jump from here and there, but it will go in that particular order until you attain the do you have to be a Buddhist monk and practice that style of life in order to achieve that? Or <coughs> if you are a Buddhist monk, very serious monk, that is the best. <laughs> but uh, hypothetically, a normal person. <laughs> 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 Hypothetically, even lay person can practice. Lay person can practice. Provided the person has the suitable environment, psychological, physical environment. Thank you. Yes. I'm fairly new at this practice. One of my greatest wishes is to be compassionate and refrain from causing suffering to others. However, I am. I also want to have good health and be good to my body. What does the Dhamma say about uh, the consumption of animals? 
as I've been going back and forth on trying to be vegetarian, but then I hear all these things, how you know, as humans we need to consume meat, and I can't get a clear answer as to what's right. No. Do you have a question? She said she wants to be, she wants to be a compassionate person, and yet, and I want to be a vegetarian. Out um, of compassion for animals, and uh, but uh, she cannot be consistent. Sometimes for that. I wish to be compassionate to all living beings, but right. including myself, too. Right. So, what yeah. should I do? I tell you, it is a very wonderful uh, attitude. It's very, very wonderful. Uh, we practice uh, what we call metta meditation. Uh, but how I translate that into English is loving friendliness meditation. Many people call it loving kindness. I disagree with the term, with the translation. Uh, because uh, I may not talk about that because it is something that I may have been going off or something. So practice loving friendliness meditation. That's one thing one has to do to promote one's own grief, one's own uh, compassion for all living beings. And among uh, other things is practice uh, uh, compassion, that's called karuna, the second of the four uh, sublime states. While practicing that, one lives compassionate life by not hurting anybody, any living being, uh, in thought, words and deed, and acting with mindfulness, with living friendliness and compassion. So we first think and we speak with this attitude and we act with this attitude. In order to act in, with this attitude in our eating, drinking, in our behavior, we always must keep this in mind. You said about uh, eating meat. Mm -hmm. uh, it is very uh, uh, meaningful wholesome, good uh, practice to be a vegetarian, to address your own conscience. Uh, because you might indirect feel you are contributing to killing indirectly <coughs> if you consume meat. But that is controversial because by abstaining from meat, it in itself is not contributing to compassion. Or by eating meat, you are not going to be compassionate. Or by not eating meat, you are not going to be compassionate. Because many vegetarians can be even murderers. Look at the Hitler. He was vegetarian. And how many millions of people he killed. So being a vegetarian itself is not a guarantee of practicing compassion. And sometimes meat eating itself also is not uh, against the practice of compassion. So eating meat and not eating meat is a controversial it is not what we eat that makes us compassionate, but how we think, how we act, 
how we speak. Even a, for instance, even a monk may not necessarily be a vegetarian because when he takes arms ball, goes from house to house, people offer whatever they have in their house. He is not a chooser, he is a beggar, he is not a chooser. He is the one who is supposed to accept what people offer. What people offer. Whether he is that or not is a different question. So we accept. Uh, so to be completely uh, pure vegan, vegetarian uh, is uh, uh, not a necessary condition uh, to be a compassionate person. <coughs> so long as one is not directly or indirectly involved in killing, supporting killing, promoting killing, uh, one can stay away from that and still can practice compassion in thoughts, words and deeds. Okay?